Ready? Tyson was born at 40 weeks, no complications at that point. When he was six months old, he contracted bacterial meningitis that caused a really severe traumatic brain injury. And as a result of that brain injury, he has lifelong complex epilepsy and cerebral palsy. Tyson is complete care, so even though he can use a communication device, we've had to work really closely with, you know, speech therapist, occupational therapists, and then for his eating, he has a feeding tube, so we administer food and medications. You know, we're just really involved in those everyday activities, um, but needing support to the same degree as like a six or eight month old baby would. Christian is nonverbal. He has global brain damage. He's full care. I have to um, lift him. Um, dress him. Mouth care is huge because his mouth is always open. He has a feeding pump, so making sure that he gets enough calories and they stay in him. Make sure he's comfortable. Make sure he's entertained. Let's put you down. I want you up a little bit more. There we go. When he was 11 months old, he um, crawled out of the doggy door and he fell into the family pool. He was unconscious and had no pulse and no breathing when the paramedics got there, but it was enough to cause global brain damage. And they tried and they tried and they had asked us to come in and say goodbye to him. Um, and so when we went in and I put my hand on his leg and said his name, he came back. He, they said, we have a pulse. But every little test, he passed. So we just went with him. The temporary paid parent caregiver program that's been in place since 2020 has been serving families in Arizona with, who have children with disabilities. We were always kind of living paycheck to paycheck, trying to catch up. We both have advanced degrees, but me, um, being Tyson's primary caregiver, I wasn't able to go and work in the same capacity that I would otherwise, even if I had more of a typical child experience. Did you know that maple trees make little helicopters called Samaras? It's definitely affected every member in the family, directly or indirectly. Being his caregiver plus figuring out how that's gonna work when you can't just call like a babysitter down the street. It definitely limits kind of um, what your career goals are. In Arizona, there are currently about three and a half thousand members who serve as parent direct care workers for their minor children. As of August, 2023, only about 8% of those are receiving at least 40 hours a week as paid parent providers. In 2020, the state of Arizona came out with a program to support families who were isolating, where we could become paid family providers. If you'll remember, everything kind of shut down. Um, so it was really important for us that we gave parents a flexibility to allow for them to either deliver care to their children in a way that made sense to them and supplement the workforce that was no longer comfortable entering into another family's home. Most people, don't understand what it would be like to have a stranger come into your home, um, do very personal tasks for your children, and to live in your same space with you for, you know, anywhere from 20 to 80 hours a week. You say, uh, boo. Yeah. Yeah. Are you feeling better? Yeah. Families like mine, we've had the experience prior to COVID of having a really difficult time finding people to come in and work with our kiddos. What we are currently concerned about is that direct care worker shortage is even more severe now post COVID than it was prior to. We have known um, that there are, are workforce pressures on that, um, on the direct care workforce. Um, there's not enough to meet the assessed need, but it is a, a tough workforce to recruit for and a tough workforce to retain. We've probably had probably somewhere between 
20 to 30 different providers over the years. And typically their employment lasts anywhere from a couple weeks to on a good case about six to eight months. It's only logical that we take a step to, to help compensate and, and um, resolve for, for that gap in the system that exists for parents who want to provide care. We already have the skills and often we're the ones training attendant care givers that are moving into the house. So that is cut out of the equation. It's just business as usual. Being regular is a big issue with kids that aren't, you know, have a limited diet and they're not actively walking around and creating like a natural flow of the body. So it's really important to keep them pretty regular being able to take care of our child, not have a lot of different bodies and a lot of different outside exposure in the home. Parents providing care to their minor children have to go through the same exact uh, training protocols that any other direct care worker needs. Parents are able to go and be employed and trained as um, care providers so that they can work with their children one-on-one. -on -one. We also have the capacity to work with anybody else's children who receives those services and it's a huge fi financial um, burden that is lifted off of these families that can't have two incomes sometimes because one parent has to stay in. And what about single parent families? I was a single mom with Christian um, and Lola for um, a few years. So I'm so passionate about this for the people that need this program as much as I did. You want to do choices? Okay. Do you want to play your DJ board or use your communication device? Prior to COVID, a lot of families experienced the inability to have outside help come in and support their children. And so with this program, those families are able to receive payment for what the care that they've been providing um, for many years unpaid. So that really validates their employment experience as a valuable contribution to their child and to society. The federal flexibility approval, um, waiver approval, is what gives us the authority um, to reimburse parents for these services on a temporary basis. We've gotten an indication from the federal government that we can have an extension of that flexibility. This program as a permanent option is a huge security to the disability community in general. We started having discussions with our community, so thousands of parents providing services like I am, on how we really want this to continue, but right now we just have our stories. We just have our experience. And so through Raising Voices Coalition, we were able to find data that would help advocate for a permanent program. Having that dialogue with parents and with the community that's going to be impacted by this is it's paramount to making this program a success. Um, we're only as good at meeting the need as we are aware of what the need is. It means that families will be able to think long term, not just a few months ahead, and they'll be able to financially plan and plan the care you know, organization of their household on a more permanent basis. I'm able to relax definitely a lot more and enjoy, uh, enjoy Christian. It's a very stressful life having a child that is, um, has special needs and the world is not built for him. But this program is just one more thing that takes uh, a weight off of our shoulders. When I have support from an outside provider at least 20 to 40 hours a week, it helps me survive the best. So I'm able to have that balance of being his care provider when it's needed and then also have that outside support. I don't see this program taking away jobs from anyone. I think it just adds jobs to the community as well as really puts the career caregivers where they're most needed. We're really excited to make this uh, a permanent feature of the access program for, for those minor members being served in our long-term care program. Having this program allows single parent families, rural families, low-income families not to have to rely on state assistance. It helps us focus on that rather than worrying about making ends meet. We hope to see this move across the country to really support families and individuals with disabilities across the board. I feel like it's a win-win all the way around.